In this lecture, what I'll cover is social identity theory with its origins in realistic conflict theory in an experiment run by Musafar Sharif, who we know from our last video lectures, as well as uh, the transformation of social identity theory into uh, what is currently known as uncertainty identity theory. And it's a very interesting area of research. I think one of the most important areas of research within social psychology that's currently going on today. Uh, but to start this discussion, we have to go again back to uh, the mid-20th century, uh, and in this case to 1954, when Musafar Sharif and his wife Carolyn uh, arranged for uh, sets of boys, two sets of 11 boys in each group, to have a summer camp experience with cabins in the park, and this uh, took place at uh, Robbers Cave State Park. The two groups did not know that the other group existed. What uh, Sharif wanted to do was set up a situation in which the two groups of boys would um, at one point be introduced to each other after they had formed group identities, and at that point, after they're introduced, they start engaging in competitive games in order to get a highly desirable prize, a large pocket knife that each member of the winning team would win at the end of their time at the summer camp. Now, this experiment has uh, gone into uh, history as one of the more influential, although not one of the most influential, but certainly one of the more influential uh, studies on group dynamics in social psychology. Uh, and all social psych textbooks today all undergraduate social psychology textbooks cover this topic in some detail. Uh, here's a, a schematic of the campground, uh, and this is taken from Sharif's book where he describes the, uh, the experiment in detail. And you can see that it's divided into two areas, the top side reserved for one group who called themselves the Rattlers, and the uh, bottom half reserved for the other group who called themselves the Eagles. The campgrounds had a variety of different buildings in it, uh, recreation halls, dining halls, cabins, and you can see that there's a lake. And the terrain at this uh, state park is uh, fairly rocky and has a variety of caves uh, on, the, on the grounds. And it's called Robber's Cave for a purpose because in the uh, 19th century, uh, famous uh, robbers such as Jesse James and others hid out there. And so there's some history that would be very appealing uh, for uh, young adolescent boys. Uh, here's a photo that shows uh, uh, one of the groups of boys on a hiking expedition, and you can see a, a more contemporary photograph that's lined up against uh, that similar location. I don't know if it's the exact location, uh, but similar location um, so that you can see in color what it looks like. And these two groups of boys were given uh, a period of time in which they could form their own group identities before they're introduced to the other groups. And you can see that uh, this involves a number of activities such as canoeing and camping and hiking. They spontaneously came up with their names and it's, it's kind of interesting that the names are fairly similar uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, identifying with wild uh, animals that they might encounter. Uh, here's one of the caves. And these images uh, were all taken by Sharif and his assistants at the, at the campsite. Everything was very well documented, including, by the way, audio tapes, which still exist, uh, although they're not easily available. Here the uh, uh, two groups of uh, campers having a competitive game. And in this photo we see that the two groups of campers have been introduced to each other and the uh, competitive games have started. And so the, the, the kids are fighting each other using a tug of war and they've made banners uh, that proclaim their group identities. Both sides did uh, similar banners. Now one of the things that Sharif was interested in was the fact that the the kids on either uh, camp uh, tended to have raids against the other camp. Uh, and so the hostilities begin to increase to the point where children are having food fights in the mess hall. 
Uh, in fact, there are photographs documenting the food all over the floor and the tables of the mess hall after the kids have departed. And the, the kids raided each other's cabins, sometimes just uprooting the uh, bedding from the, um, from the bunk beds, uh, and at other times actually stealing things. The eagles won the pocket knives, but uh, the pocket knives were in turn stolen by the rattlers. One of the things that Sharif did, and of course we don't have time to go over the full set of results, but one of the things that Sharif did was ask the uh, campers, the boys, to rate each other group member as well as the out-group members in terms of their favorability, and uh, he plotted them out in the way that you see here. So this figure from uh, Sharif's uh, text on the uh, experiment reads stereotype ratings of in-group and out-group members on six characteristics. The way to interpret this particular graph is that you have uh, favorability on the x-axis with the left-hand side being highly unfavorable and the right-hand side being highly favorable. And then the y-axis has percentage of uh, ratings by the different uh, children. The solid lines are the in-group ratings and the dashed lines are the out-group ratings for the eagles and the rattlers. And so that you can see that the two tallest points in this graph are on the right-hand side where you have the rattler and eagle solid lines indicating favorable in-group ratings. And then on the left-hand side, the dashed lines are higher. The eagle and rattler dashed lines are higher, which indicates out-group ratings being unfavorable. So Sharif seems to have accomplished what he set out to do, which is to uh, induce hostility uh, between the groups as the, as the groups compete over the scarce resources uh, of the pocket knives. And the way that this was interpreted by Sharif and uh, by others over the years is uh, in terms of what's called realistic conflict theory, that when people are in competition with each other for scarce resource, then you tend to have heightened uh, in-group favoritism and out-group hostility. Uh, and that's the cause of wars and so on, uh, at least in terms of the interpretation of the theory itself. But keep in mind that this was a mid-20th century theory, and this was one of the first uh, early attempts to uh, try to uh, work on outgroup hostility in an experimental, real-world type of setting. After uh, Sharif was successful in getting hostility uh, between the groups, he wanted to also try to see if he could reduce the hostility. So what he did next is he uh, staged a number of different incidents where the two groups would have to work together in order to resolve the incident. For example, the lunch truck broke down, got stuck in a ditch, and the kids had to work together using the, the same rope that they had previously used for the tug of war. Now they had to work together to tug the, um, the lunch truck out of the ditch. So they, they, they had to be cooperative. Uh, in another staged episode, the water line to the large water tank that you see in this photo, uh, the water line was clogged and the uh, campers had to work together to locate the source of the clog uh, and to fix it. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to have refreshing, cool water. And so, again, they're working together. And there were a number of different uh, uh, episodes like this that were staged where the kids had to work together. And in this graph, what we see is the shift from the end of phase two, which is the uh, conclusion of the competitive games. That's the left-hand side, and you can see that the, the ratings for the out-group members by both uh, the Eagles and the Rattlers, uh, the ratings of the other group members, is highly negative, hi highly unfavorable. There are very few that are giving favorable uh, reactions to out-group members. On the other hand, after the conclusion of stage three, where you have these uh, different staged cooperative incidents occurring, uh, what we see is that there's a very steep uh, increase in favorability ratings for outgroup members. So the Eagles are rating the outgroup members positively, and the Rattlers uh, are really rating the outgroup members very positively. 
So again, this was termed by Sharif uh, as realistic conflict theory, uh, and the idea was that uh, people will become more hostile toward each other and toward outgroup members specifically when they are competing for scarce resources. So we would imagine that in times of economic decline uh, or scarcity that uh, people would identify outgroups to target and to uh, potentially become hostile with. Now one other thing needs to be said about Sharif's research. Uh, this was not the first time that he had done this particular study. In fact, uh, the year before, he did a different version of the study with the same aims. And I say different just because it was a different group of kids in a different uh, setting. Uh, and he completely failed to get the animosity that he was looking for between the groups. He buried the results of that study, never published it, never talked about it. And in fact, in the archives that are available, there is uh, scant information about that other version of the experiment that uh, did not work. By the way, there's an excellent book by Gina Perry, an Australian psychologist who does research on famous uh, studies. Uh, she published, uh, a few years ago, published a book on the Milgram uh, Obedience Study, which revealed uh, a lot of very damning information about the Milgram study. And in her latest book called The Lost Boys, Perry goes into detail on exactly what Sharif found in his previous experiment and the types of things that he did during the well-documented experiment, which call into question a lot of his results. Basically, there were uh, multiple areas in which the children were prodded or pushed into doing particular things. And so it's hard to think that this study that Sharif did that's so famous today actually stands up to uh, empirical scrutiny. Uh, so that's a highly recommended book. I'll post the link for the book in Canvas. And again, that's Gina Perry, and her book is called The Lost Boy. This notion was uh, picked up, uh, I suppose, independently. I don't know the history on that. So I, I don't know if the author of the, the book, The Lord of the Flies, actually got his ideas from Sharif's work. But uh, there's an eerie parallel here. And so... If you've read the book or seen the film, I, if, uh, there's a more recent version of the film, but I recommend the 1963 version. It's uh, cinemagraphically much better. And so if you, if you recall anything about the book or the film, uh, it involves a plane crash where uh, the film opens up. Um, at, you don't actually see the plane crash, but miraculously all these uh, young English schoolboys survive the crash and there are no adults. The adults did not survive. So now the kids are on a deserted tropical island and they have to fend for themselves, make their own civilization as they await rescue. At first the boys all work together, but a rift forms between the more athletic boys and the more intellectual boys. You can see here that they've started taking off some of their British school uniforms. Some of them were in tatters at the beginning of the film because uh, because of the crash, you know, some of their clothes had been torn up. What happens fairly quickly is that you have a competition between two uh, two of the boys who want to be leaders, and uh, they form uh, separate groups that are still aligned with each other, uh, but they have differences of opinion about the best strategies for survival, and that's what leads to the identification of these two competing groups. The athletic, somewhat older boys, and I say older just because some of these boys were a little bit taller in the film, uh, start painting themselves in what looks like a sort of tribal get-up. And the, the tension rises, uh, uh, particularly as the leader of the painted group tries to gain control over uh, all of the boys on the island. And in this uh, particular photograph, uh, you see in the background the a uh, boy who's standing on the rock is the leader of the more intellectual boys. The painted group starts becoming more menacing and threatening. And uh, at one point they uh, successfully hunt and kill a pig. And so now they have uh, a great deal of resources. The other boys are left to uh, fare for, for themselves or beg for some, some meat from the painted group. On the evening of the day in which the painted group successfully kills the pig, uh, as they're cooking the pig, there's a big bonfire, 
and there's a very dramatic scene uh, in which the intellectual group is begging for meat. The painted group has what uh, can best be described as a bloodlust dance. That is to say that they're they're dancing around the fire in a very aggressive manner and they're chanting uh, and ultimately what happens is that they they keep chanting kill the pig kill the pig and they murder one of the younger boys one of the younger boys in the other more intellectual group so that's the first murder that takes place tensions are very very high at this point and there's there's a question about whether or not the painted group will just take over everything and the leader of the painted group uh, always hated one of the kids who they derisively called Piggy. In a critical scene in the in the film, what they do is they dislodge a very large boulder on top of a cliff, and they push it down on Piggy, crushing him to death. And the one remaining outgroup member runs for his life. As he's running for his life, at the very end, when it looks like he's about to be also murdered, uh, the um, the rescue comes, the rescue team comes. You never actually see the adults, you just see the adult uh, feet. You don't see the actual adults. So it's entirely shot from the point of view of the children in this alternate uh, civilization. So it's a nice uh, sort of symbolic representation of realistic conflict theory. The tendency, at least in the thinking at the time, the tendency of very easily forming into these uh, competitive groups and the competitive groups would naturally lead to tension and hostilities against the other groups. Now moving back to some actual research, the next up is Henri Tajfel. I've heard his name pronounced a number of different ways. Tajfel, Tajfel, and also Tifel. I'll pronounce it uh, Tajfel. Tajfel was a Polish Jew and was a chemistry student at the Sorbonne University in Paris when World War II broke out. If he had been in Poland during the uh, Nazi invasion of Poland in World War II, he probably would have been murdered by the, by the Nazi. But since he was in France, what he did, being a fluent uh, speaker of French, he joined the French resistance, but he was quickly taken prisoner. And during the time that he was a prisoner in France, prisoner of the Germans after the Germans invaded France, he had to hide his true identity. So he pretended that he was a French national rather than being Polish, and uh, worse, he had a Polish Jew, which would have uh, meant uh, that he would have been taken to the extermination camps. His entire family who, who stayed in Poland had been exterminated during World War II. They had all been murdered. And this, in part, drove Tajfel to study psychology, which he did in Britain. By the 1970s, Tajfel was chair of the psychology department at University of Bristol and was actively studying the topic of racism, probably because of what had happened to his family and his experience as a prisoner of war. In a series of experiments, Tajfel used meaningless preferences to assign people to one group or the other. And this is a, a rather well-known series of experiments, and they're quite interesting. They formed what uh, we can think of essentially as the root of this new theory that took over from realistic conflict theory, which uh, by the 1970s was no longer seen as being directly applicable. There are just too many uh, unexplained uh, issues with realistic conflict theory. Tajfel used the series of experiments in which people were randomly assigned in some of these, they were English school kids, which is, again, sort of an eerie parallel to the uh, Lord of the Flies example. Uh, Tajfel assigned people randomly to one group or the other and then asked them to allocate resources or make preference ratings for people who were either in their group or in another group. I'll give just one example, but uh, there are a bunch of different uh, studies like this using different stimuli. In 1971, Tajfel, Billig, Bundy, and Flament published an article in which participants were shown paintings by either Paul Klee or Vasily Kandinsky. Now I've put two images up to demonstrate Klee and Kandinsky. You can see that the two paintings are similar in style, in the modern art style. And honestly, I don't know which one is which. I couldn't tell you the difference unless, unless I looked up uh, the information, you know, or at least looked uh, closer to see if there's a signature on it. It really doesn't matter. So the participants, there were 32 of them, and they're split into two groups. 
the participants are shown a series of different uh, paintings, and half of them are by Klee and half of them are by Kandinsky. They're shown these pairs of paintings and they're, they're asked, which one do you prefer? After that, after that task, the participants are told that they either preferred Klee or Kandinsky. But this is totally random. It was random in the sense that the ratings that were given by the people as to whether or not they preferred one or the other were not actually used. Rather, what happened is that uh, Tajpel and his colleagues randomly assigned the participants to either the Klee group or the Kandinsky group, falsely telling them that they had preferred one of the artists or the other of the artists. So that's the independent variable. The IV, or independent variable, is the uh, assignment of participants to one group or the other, and it's completely random. And for the dependent variable, the participants had to assign points to members of the in-group, the out-group, or mixed equally between the in-group and out-group. So you're given an, uh, an option. You're given a choice as to whether you would prefer to have your points that you're allocating go to members of your own group, even though you're not getting them, or to members of the out-group, or have it mixed equally between the two groups. And that's, that's really just the very basic outline of the experiment. In that particular paper, there are a series of different sets of results. This is the cleanest one to, uh, to show uh, for the purpose of this video lecture. And what we see in this table is that on the left-hand side, 72.3% of the subjects had a majority of their responses favoring their own group. Uh, in the middle, 8.5% of the respondents or subjects had an equal number of types of responses. They were uh, uh, choosing the option to equally distribute the points between both groups. And on the right-hand side, 19.2% of the participants had a majority of their responses favoring the other group. So I'm surprised actually that it's as high as that. The way that Tajfel referred to this is that it's a minimal group paradigm. That is to say that uh, there's no opportunity here for the participants to get to know one another as they had done in the uh, Sharif summer camp experiment, the robber's cave experiment, where the kids are actually camping with each other, they're in the bunkhouses with each other. They're really forming a, a strong group identity. The Sharif study we can think of as a maximal group paradigm, but in the Tajfil study, it's referred to as a minimal group paradigm because they don't really know anything at all about other members of the group. All they know is that uh, I'm in the Klee group and the other people also preferred Klee. Or in one of the other versions of the experiment that Tajfel ran, uh, he used dots and he said that uh, uh, you are a dot overestimator. When you look at a, a graphic that has uh, hundreds of dots on it uh, and you have to estimate the number of dots, you are a dot overestimator or you are a dot underestimator. And just based on that, do you then prefer people of your own group or are you fair? in distribution of uh, resources, or do you prefer people of the outgroup? So again here, I'm sort of surprised that you have 19.2 percent of the participants in this particular study with the Klee and Kandinsky paintings, 19.2 uh, percent favoring uh, most of the time uh, members of the outgroup. But nevertheless, you can see that there's a strong pattern that people are preferring to allocate resources to members of their own group. I think probably the most logical thing to do, because you don't know anything about any of the participants in the study, if you were in the study would be to equally distribute the resources between both groups. I suppose one way that uh, participants might be looking at it is I'll allocate resources to my own group and I'll operate under the assumption that the other people in the group will also do the same thing and therefore I'll get a lot of resources and I'll pay them back that way. So there's uh, perhaps, to some extent, the norm of reciprocity at work here, uh, that uh, you give something uh, as a form of gratuity, uh, knowing that you'll get something else in return. Although it's based on faith here, it's, uh, you don't have any interaction with the other people, so it's hard to know. Tajfel proposed that social categorization, uh, which is what's taking place here in terms of the in-group, out-group distinction, is a fundamental human process and that it serves a self-protective function. So if you, if you know that you're a member of a group and if that group is successful, then by extension, you too would be successful. Here's a model that describes how this works. This is the typical model that appears in textbooks. Uh, in fact, I believe I, uh, and this is typically attributed to a paper by Tajfel and Turner. 
Uh, Tajfel's model explains in-group favoritism and out-group derogation as a function of the social identity of the individual. So you have the personal achievements, that's the pink row of boxes across the top. Your own personal identity is rooted in your own achievements and that leads to self-esteem. But on the other hand, you also have social identities and to some extent that simply involves being attached to a group. And uh, if that group is successful, then that boosts your self-esteem. So obviously what's going to happen is that uh, you'll have more fans gravitating towards um, uh, sports clubs that are successful. There has been research on this. In fact, uh, uh, the sales and memorabilia uh, of teams goes way up after wins. If uh, And that makes sense according to, to the theory. If you, if you have a a need for self-esteem, you're not going to buy the uh, memorabilia when the uh, team loses. So this also leads uh, in the bottom pathway toward favoritism toward your own group, the in-group, and derogation of out-group. So the way to think about this particular pathway on the bottom is that if you're a member of a group and if you facilitate the success of your group, then the group will be successful or at least you'll help them be successful and by extension then some of that achievement of the group will rub off on you. And this sometimes in the literature is referred to as basking in reflected glory. The dark side of this lower pathway is the derogation aspect. Hostility between groups is uh, seen as sort of a natural outcome in Tajfel's model, a natural outcome of the need for self-esteem. If you have self-esteem needs that are unfulfilled through personal identity and your own achievements, derogating out groups is one way to make your group look better. After Tajfel passed away, his colleague Turner kept working on the model uh, with some new collaborators. Within a, a short span of time, they had developed a, a different version of the theory uh, in terms of uh, offshoots or companion theories. So the traditional theory is known as social identity theory, and that relates to intergroup relations in terms of favoritism and derogation, as I just described, uh, but also social categorization theory, uh, in which intragroup processes are involved, which include group salience, group polarization, and group identification. In the original social identity theory model, or SIT, it appears that self-esteem really runs the entire process, that everything is based on self-esteem needs. Now, more recently, research by Hogg has is, is really changed things around in this area, and this is what I referred to at the beginning as one of the most important, or at least to, to my mind, interesting areas of research in social psychology today. I think it explains a lot of what we're seeing today in the year 2020 in terms of uh, hostility between different groups, politically speaking, in the United States and elsewhere. Now, as described by Hogg in 2001, the categorization process involves accentuation of perceived differences between categories. In other words, in-group versus out-group differences get exaggerated, as well as an accentuation of perceived similarities within the in-group. So everyone inside the in-group is perceived as sharing the same positive traits. Oh, you're one of us, so you must believe this too. Oh, you're one of us, so you must be one of the good ones too. But members of the out-group are perceived and assumed to be uh, greatly different than us. So I think what this does very nicely, uh, which the older theories did not do, is to bring in a social cognitive aspect. Research in social cognition wasn't as advanced in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s when some of the earlier uh, theories were pr uh, proposed, but today we can see uh, you know, a great deal of important uh, social cognitive research as it relates to bias, prejudice, and other things like that, stereotyping. and. So this is being built into the model of intergroup relations. Now to continue with this line of thinking, while the in-group is perceived as being similar by members of the in-group, uh, there is a prototype of the in-group that serves as a reference point for social comparison purposes. If you're a member of an in-group, you don't have to actually go through the line and see what every single member is like. That would take too much time and you know the, the mind is great at making assumptions and using stereotypes as shortcuts. So what we do, according to this particular theory by Hogg, is that we have a, a prototype in mind of the, the best version of the in-group member, or the ideal version, but also the typical version of the in-group member. So these prototypes are things that we can try to use as guides in order to become successful members of the group. 
to fit in. You model yourself after the in-group prototype. Now the prototype does not have to be modal or average. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. The prototype can be an ideal member of the group. Those closest to the prototype uh, should be seen as being more likable by members in the group, whereas those who have marked differences that set them aside from the prototype, even if they are members of the in-group, they would not be as liked. Uh, they would not be liked as much. Further, group members can seek to enhance their position within the group, and in order to do this, they adopt the characteristics of the prototype. Now, in terms of being likable or unlikable, uh, recall the information that I uh, discussed in my last lit uh, video lecture about the Schachter study with the Johnny Rocco. Uh, case vignette. People really did not like the person in the group who disagreed with the group. Going against the group sets you apart. The members of the group will not appreciate the fact that you're disagreeing with the consensus of the group. And people ought to be very uh, keenly aware of this, particularly if they have low self-esteem or they, they're trying very hard to fit into a group. They'll be uh, closely monitoring the social situation to see what the opinions, views, and behaviors of the group members are, uh, and they'll try to conform to those in order to avoid looking like they're not a group member. Group members who seek to enhance their position within the group may perceive an extreme variation of the prototype. That is to say, they may have in their mind an extreme variation of the group prototype, which may not be shared by all members of the group. This may be idiosyncratic in terms of the interpretation of a, a small number or even a single member of the in-group. Such an individual may model their behavior accordingly to that uh, sort of extreme prototype position, and that explains group polarization. As people in the group interact, there's a tendency of the group to become more extreme in the shared viewpoint of whatever it is that they happen to be talking about. Historically, that's largely been researched in mock jury studies, group polarization effect being something that happens when you have a majority opinion on a jury deliberating about the guilt or innocence of a individual uh, charged with a crime, that wherever you start out in terms of a majority at the beginning of deliberations, that viewpoint tends to get accentuated over time. Tajfel's social identity theory model encountered a problem in the sense that low self-esteem does not always induce identification of people with a group. And that's a problem for the theory if the core of the theory is that everything is being motivated by self-esteem needs. So if the primary motivating force, i.e. self-esteem, does not seem to work as the model predict, then there must be something yet to be discovered about the model. Or it could be that there's a totally different model that works better. And now I can turn to the research of Michael Hogg, which is uh, very interesting stuff, and I assigned several of his articles for reading in class, and so I'd like to go over them in detail. Hogg is a social psychologist who studied in England, at the same college that Taj Fell had been at. And uh, currently, uh, he has a, a teaching position and research position at Claremont Graduate University in California. Michael Hogg's update to social identity theory changes it in terms of its fundamental structure. And Hogg's version of this theory is called uncertainty identity theory. The motivation is not the need for self-esteem, which it was in the uh, earlier theory in social identity theory. Self-esteem is uh, described like a drive. It's a drive model like hunger. But rather, it's the fact that uncertainty about social position causes anxiety, and we strive to reduce this state of anxiety. This makes it more of a homeostatic model. That is to say, when you have a, a state of anxiety, the natural reaction of the organism is to uh, try to reduce that state of anxiety. Group identification occurs when we feel the need for greater certainty about our social position. That's the core of uncertainty identity theory, but there's a, there's a lot of nuance to it. And that's one of the reasons I like it. Homan and Hogg in their 2015 article, Fearing the Uncertain, put it this way. Self-uncertainty is powerfully motivating because people need to know who they are, how to behave, what to think, and who others are, and how they might behave, think, and treat us. Being properly located in this way renders the social world and one's place within it relatively predictable and allows us to plan effective action, avoid harm, and know who to trust. This also involves the process of depersonalization, which is defined this way. The process of categorization involves social cognition of people as types. 
This is what we would call schematic processing and social cognition. Thinking of people as types results in the in-group, out-group dichotomy as a superordinate schema. If you're one of us, then I assume you believe what I believe. If you're one of them, I have a different set of ideas describing what I think you believe. And not only that, but uh, I probably think, since you're an out-group member, that you are dumb for believing the things that you believe. But keep in mind that you know these are schemas. These are stereotypes for the beliefs. We don't actually sit down and thoroughly analyze all the things that the in-group members believe in order to determine whether or not they're all alike. Uh, nor do we sit down and rationally think about what the outgroup members believe. We're basing this all on assumptions. In this sense, we depersonalize ourselves by trying to match the figurative exemplar of the in-group in our uh, actions and thoughts. We depersonalize the other by making assumptions about their beliefs and then judging them as wrong. This is what categorization does. It results in the depersonalization of both myself and other people if I get into this position of trying to think of the, um, the group exemplar, we depersonalize ourselves by trying to match ourselves to the figurative exemplar or prototype of the in-group uh, member. And we also depersonalize the other, the out-group member, by making assumptions about what their beliefs are and then judging those beliefs to be wrong. This is what categorization does. This process involves not a rational examination of those beliefs of the in-group and out-group members, but simply the use of uh, prototypes, stereotypes, or schemas in order to figure out uh, how we should think and behave to fit in. And we make assumptions about what the out-group members are like, uh, because we're not actually going to talk to them. We're not actually going to sit down and communicate at great length to find out what their viewpoints are. We'll just base what we think on assumptions, uh, schemas, about uh, uh, who they are and what they think. Hogg and Ranella in a 2018 article described the experiential side of the shared reality of the in-group. Shared reality involves the following. People share inner states such as evaluations of in-group and out-group members. You wouldn't want to be in a group as an in-group member if you didn't first share at least some of the ideals <clears throat> and some of the positions of members of that group. And so you, you have this shared sense of reality that happens within the group. Members themselves, members share prototypes and agree on the meanings of things. So in discussions with other group members, you talk about um, various different aspects of being a member of the group uh, in your conversations and uh, those form into prototypes and uh, we mutually agree as this happens the group members mutually agree on the meanings of these prototypes group membership involves shared emotional reactions to specific events or issues so when something happens that challenges the group or that accentuates the group uh, the conversations within the group the communications uh, will evolve in such a way that uh, the shared emotional reactions will be quite similar. And of course that's a way to uh, finesse uh, who's an in-group member uh, and who's uh, a member in good standing uh, versus a peripheral group member. So all of this in turn uh, solidifies the sense of belongingness to the group. Membership in the group reduces anxiety about one's place in the world, uh, particularly if the group is successful. Membership involves prescribing certain thoughts and behaviors. So if you're one of us, these are the things that you don't do. If you're one of us, these are the things that should not cross your mind. And um, in the United States, I think one uh, good example after the uh, 2016 presidential election uh, was that uh, I saw, and you know, this is, this is just an anecdote, of course. I, I don't have any research to back it up, but I, I saw a lot of this. On social media, uh, there were uh, ample opportunities to observe people who were badgering uh, members of outgroups into uh, uh, behaving or thinking of it in a particular way. In, uh, in groupthink research, this is called being a mind guard, where the mind guard pays close attention to what, what other people are saying and often corrects them and tells them that, that they're wrong in order to try to coerce, essentially, uh, conformity to the prototype of the group that that person belongs to. 
uh, the Mind Guard, in a sense, polices members of the group or people who want to be members of the group into uh, conformity of thought. And that, I think, is also very common in cults, that uh, cults are always on the lookout for expressions of uh, thought patterns that don't fit what they want. And then finally, norms are learned through communicating with high-status members. How do you determine what the group norm is? Well, uh, you would uh, look to the high-status members for information on that. Next up is an article by Homan Gaffney and Hogg in 2017 that was the um, second of the three uh, readings that I assigned for class. And this one had three different experiments. Now, there's one thing about the methodology that I'm not entirely clear on, and I'll explain how that works. Participants were given a fake personality test that was supposed to be able to tell whether they were artistic or scientific personality types. And it should be mentioned that all the participants here are American participants. They're all American college students. The participants take the personality test and then they're given feedback about uh, their personality in terms of you have an artistic personality or you have a scientific personality. Now this is totally random. The test is a bogus test. It's, it has questions that uh, sound like it should be measuring these sorts of things, but there's no validity to this particular test. And furthermore, participants are randomly assigned to be told either that they were artistic or scientific personality types. The feedback that was given to the participants had absolutely no bearing to the actual results of the personality test. They're randomly told that they're one or the other personality and that people in France are either more artistic while Americans are more scientific or vice versa. Now that's, that's the part that I'm not entirely clear about. The authors of the study uh, don't specifically state whether or not the French are always described as being artistic and Americans always as scientific or if that was also randomized. So I'm not entirely clear on that point, but uh, I think that's okay. Now the key thing to understand here uh, is that half of the time these American participants are told that they are unlike the typical American. <laughs> uh, and and so, I mean, that's, that's the important thing, that uh, you feel like you're more French than you are American. Now if the authors of the study varied both the position of America and France in terms of being artistic and scientific as well as the randomization of subjects personality then we would see a two by two factorial ANOVA design in the structure that we see on the screen. I suspect rather that what happened is that they only used the bottom row where America was described as being scientific and the subjects personality was randomly assigned to be either uh, artistic or scientific. So, uh, you know, just focusing on the bottom row here, if America is scientific in terms of its typical personality, and that's highly debatable today, but uh, if that's how the uh, experiment was structured, then subjects' personality ratings were either described as being artistic, in which case they are unlike the typical American, and therefore their personality forms essentially a peripheral fit to the typical American personality. So if, if your personality is unlike everyone else in the country, then you have a peripheral allegiance to the in-group, that is to say, uh, of being an American. Whereas if the typical American is described as being scientific, and again I'm just sticking to the bottom row, and if the subject's personality is described as being scientific, that would bring you to the lower right-hand corner of this uh, two by two factorial design and that person would think that they are prototypical uh, in relation to their uh, their personality in relation to the typical American. Uh, taking another look at the uh, figure one from the article uh, where you have the artistic personality and the scientific personality at opposite ends of this 50 point scale you see that uh, on the left hand side you have the France average is 10.3 and on the right hand side you have the American average 40.9 and when a participant is told that their uh, personality uh, is closer to that of France uh, you see what's pictured in this uh, diagram here where your score is 14.7 the authors do not have a second graph that illustrates what it's like when you are alike the Americans uh, but I presume that what would happen is that the box would be on the uh, right hand side adjacent to the American average. The, the key thing here is because all subjects are Americans, telling them that they are more like the French uh, makes them feel peripheral to their identity as being an American. And that is the peripheral induction, that's the independent variable here. 
The dependent variable was the level of uncertainty that people have. The authors have a scale uh, with questions like this. My beliefs about myself often conflict with one another. On one day I might have an opinion of myself and on another day I might have a different opinion. I feel that I am not really the person that I appear to be. And when I think about the kind of person I have been in the past, I'm not sure what I was really like. So if you have a high rate of uncertainty about your uh, identity, then you would be agreeing with these statements at a higher level than a person who has uh, a strong sense of self. If you have a strong sense of self, then your score would be rather low. And here are the findings, the first set of findings. Those who were peripheral reported a greater level of uncertainty, the F test result F equals 7.64. And the symbol over here, the what looks like an N squared with a P, that's uh, partial eta squared. Uh, and that's the index of effect size it's telling you that this uh, independent variable accounts for about 5% of the variance of the uh, dependent variable of uncertainty. So those who were tricked into believing that they were peripheral to the American uh, personality type reported a greater level of uncertainty about themselves. And that's one of the Im important findings in order for this theory to work. If you don't have this condition met, then the theory itself can't function. So it's, it's critical to have this in place. But this isn't the whole story. Experiment 2 involved the same peripheral manipulation using the false feedback on the personality test as well as an uncertainty prime. And the uncertainty prime independent variable worked like this. Please take a few moments and think about things in life that make you feel uncertain. Just telling someone to do that will accentuate their feeling of uncertainty, uh, if only temporarily, priming people to think of a particular thing or think of a times that things worked okay or not so well for them will make them feel more like a success or failure or whatever it is that you're trying to prime, uh, at least for a temporary uh, period of time. So the high uncertainty group was uh, given the prime, please take a few moments to think about things that made you feel uncertain, while the low uncertainty group was primed to think about things that made them feel more certain about their identity. And you see the structure of the experiment changes. Now uh, in the columns we have subjects personality either prototypical being like the typical American or peripheral uh, being like uh, the typical Frenchman. So now when we look at the matrix uh, that's shown on this page what I've done here is I've diagrammed the structure of the experiment as it currently stands, experiment number two where you have subjects personality in columns the prototypical person thinks that he or she is similar to the typical American whereas the peripheral person in this experiment thinks that his or her personality type is more like the typical French uh, citizen and then in the rows on the other uh, side of the diagram you have the uncertainty prime high or low for those who have high uncertainty you have prototypical uncertain or peripheral uncertain and and uh, similarly for the low, you have prototypical certain and peripheral certain. The dependent variable was the strength of identification with the university, and the idea here was that if you uh, remove all the stable identity components regarding nationality, there's one thing that's easy for these people to think about because they're college students, and that is their college. So people uh, in this experiment were predicted to identify more with a successful group that they can easily affiliate with. And the hypothesis here essentially that flows from the theory is that having the feedback that uh, your personality is peripheral to the typical American, particularly if you have a high sense of uncertainty, then those who are peripheral and uncertain would be more apt to rate their college as being preferable. So they'll have a higher allegiance to uh, this group that they are easily able to affiliate with. And looking at some of the results, um, in this particular bar graph what we see is the, the ratings of identification with the college that the participants attended. And there's a significant interaction effect which makes the uh, main effects a little bit more tricky to interpret. The, the main effect here was marginally significant. But looking at the interaction effect, uh, what we see is that on the left hand side the pair of bars over here, those two bars are for the peripheral induction. So what we're interested in this experiment is those who, um, those participants who think that they are peripheral in terms of their personality is related to the typical American. 
and also those who are uncertain, those who are primed to feel uncertain about their sense of selves. So these are the specific people of all four of these groups. The one on the far left hand side is the group that's predicted to have the highest level of rating. So we see that there is a difference here. The, uh, the interaction effect uh, in terms of the 2x2 two two factorial ANOVA appears to support the hypothesis that being peripheral and uncertain heightens the sense of allegiance that the person has to the group. And moving on to experiment three, this one had the same design as experiment two, but used a different dependent variable. Uh, the dependent variable here was in-group bias or preference uh, for people who are also at the same college. Uh, and overall, this set of results is uh, very good evidence for Hogg's model uh, of the uncertainty identity theory. And so you see that uh, on the right-hand side, the prototypical, um, the people who are given feedback, their personalities are typical of those of Americans generally. There's no difference in terms of their ratings. Those two bars are the same height. But on the left-hand side, the, those who were peripheral to the typical American, if they were given the certainty induction, it didn't seem to matter. They, they don't have any increase in their uh, in-group bias. But those who were uncertain, you see that there's this marked uh, increase in their in-group bias. And so that's, it's good evidence that uh, shows that, well, uncertainty happens uh, under certain conditions. And furthermore, that uncertainty, particularly when you combine it with peripherality, that you're not really like the group that you think you're a member of, that leads to a larger in-group bias. Next up is Goldman and Hogg from 2016, going to extremes for one's group, the role of prototypicality and group acceptance. This is the third of the series that I assigned for reading for class. In this particular experiment, uh, what they did is uh, they had the primary hypothesis that peripheral group members who believed that their behaviors could result in acceptance would report higher intent to engage in those behaviors, and they were antisocial behaviors, which makes it particularly interesting. They had a sample of 218 college students who were members of fraternities and sororities. They wanted to do this because they were measuring their uh, affiliation with those fraternities and sororities as part of their uh, experiment. The independent variables were prototypicality, where the prototypicality induction involved having subjects think of examples of traits that they had that matched the group ideal. Acceptance induction is the second independent variable, and that involved having subjects think of examples of how easy or difficult it was to gain acceptance. So these are two different independent variables. Prototypicality, you either think of things that make you uh, sound like the typical group member, or you're asked to think of things that don't make you look like the typical group member, uh, and that's that prime uh, can be effective at making people think that they fit in or, or not fit in. Uh, and then acceptance induction similarly is a prime where people are asked simply to uh, think about how easy it was to gain acceptance to the group or how difficult it was. Now the key thing with these primes is that the authors are asking the participants to think of three episodes in which it was easy or hard to gain acceptance. Three types of uh, characteristics in which they're typical of their group or three characteristics that they have that make them not typical of their group. And, and that sort of priming can be very effective at uh, at least temporarily changing one's outlook. Then the dependent variable uh, that the authors had, uh, they used the scale of aggressive behaviors directed at outgroups, which were uh, ostensibly other fraternities or sororities. How likely would it be that you could engage in something like stealing from another group uh, or uh, something like that? It's a fairly extensive survey with uh, a lot of different types of antisocial behaviors. In terms of the results, they had a significant interaction of 8.33, the P is less than 0.05. Uh, and you can see the bar graph down here. So when you have a peripheral member whose acceptance was easy, you have a, a heightened rate of endorsement of these antisocial behaviors that they think that would be okay to commit. And so just focus on the, the right-hand side where you have the peripheral members because that's where the action is. The, uh, the simple effect test that was reported here, they didn't actually identify it as a simple effect test but they're uh, comparing the two bars uh, on the right-hand side against each other. And that result was f equals 7.23 with a partial eta squared uh, of 0.034. So the effect size is fairly small, uh, however it is significant. 
uh, the F test that is, is, is significant. The key thing here is the elevation for those who are peripheral to the group who believe that uh, acceptance is easy, they're endorsing all these antisocial things that they could do against the NAUP group. The implication here, of course, is that if you feel that you currently do not fit into the group that you want to be part of, and if you think that doing things like this, these antisocial things, will ingratiate yourself with the group, then you'll be more apt to do that, to do these antisocial things. I mean, if you think of something like um, a terrorist organization, the, the, the recruitment uh, involves focusing on people who feel that they've been cast out. And it's the same for cults. That was my exact experience with the Moonies, that uh, they were specifically looking for people who did not fit in. And I had a strong sense of self-esteem, so, you know, all their tricks when I was in that Mooney cult, all their tricks in terms of trying to persuade me to become a member, they failed. I didn't have any need to be a member of that group to satisfy my self-esteem needs. But if I had been in the uh, what, we, what we might call an existential crisis, if I had been uh, recovering from drugs or something like that, then maybe I would have uh, been more apt to join that group because it would make me feel better. That's how this works. So if you, if you feel that you're on the periphery of the group that you want to be part of, and if it, uh, if it looks like the behaviors that you engage in might uh, work to make you a better member of that group, then you'll be more apt to go out and attack somebody, beat somebody up from the opposing group. And that's, again, that's how terrorist organizations work, that ultimately the idea is that people will be committing violent crimes, perhaps murders or something like that, in the name of their group, because doing so will make them uh, highly valued members of that group. Now what I'd like to do next is use Hogg's uncertainty identity theory and apply it to a specific sociological situation uh, and to do it outside of the United States because uh, if you're an American, if you're in my class and uh, you know, you're living in the United States, using the examples from America, it might be uh, covered with a little bit of baggage uh, in terms of our current political situation. Though I think the same thing could be done very easily with American politics. But let's use a different country. Let's use Germany. There was an interesting article in the New York Times a couple of years ago that I read that identified some of the uh, differences between East Germany and West Germany. And so I did a little bit more reading on it. And I came up, I found some graphs uh, that illustrate these differences quite well. In this particular figure, uh, what we see is the level of income in various different districts in Germany. And the, the red dividing line shows the uh, the part of Germany that during the Soviet Union, uh, when the Soviet Union had sway over eastern Germany, uh, this was essentially a satellite country that was separate from West Germany. It was satellite to, uh, to the Soviet Union. So they had their own government in East Germany. That East German government was subservient to the, to the USSR. What we see here is that there, today there is, and this is uh, data from 2011, there's a substantial amount of income disparity with uh, West Germany uh, being more prosperous. There's a lot more industry and uh, there's an, a lot more income and savings uh, in, in the residents in West Germany. So it sort of parallels in the United States. It parallels uh, to some extent the differences between North and South. In the next figure we see the unemployment rate and the blue, uh, the solid blue areas are for higher unemployment. You can see that uh, unemployment is very heavily concentrated in East Germany. In terms of demographics, we have age disparity shown here. And what that indicates is that you have both young people and older people in West Germany, but East Germany primarily tends to be an older cohort. So the, the age disparity is important because what it indicates is that if you have a lot of young people in your nation, those young people have a whole lifetime of work ahead of them so they'll not only be productive contributors to society, but they'll also uh, have great savings at the end of their uh, years of work uh, when they move into retirement. That savings uh, will in turn yield uh, a nation with greater wealth. The concentration of wealth is, is demonstrated both in terms of the current dollars, but in terms of the future dollars by being able to look at the demographics of age. Uh, and just the fact that the, the West German side of the country has higher concentration of the solid blue, that's an indication that you have uh, more variability, more, more variance in terms of age, so that you have 
uh, more young people as well as more older people, but in East Germany it's primarily older people. Next up is farming. This figure shows the high concentration of agricultural industry in East Germany rather than West Germany. And, you know, in the United States we might think of that uh, as being spread out across the country. Uh, it's not just concentrated in the South. There are lots of farms in the Midwest. The shift in uh, agricultural industry between East and West is, is quite pronounced. And, and West Germany has more manufacturing. Uh, so uh, much of the manufacturing takes place in the uh, southwestern uh, side of Germany. In terms of flu vaccination, this one was a real surprise to me when I saw this in this article from, uh, actually this one is from Washington Post. The flu vaccination rate is much different between East and West. And you can see that the, the solid blue, which means greater uh, adherence to flu vaccination, is concentrated in the East. So those in East Germany are getting their flu shots and those in West Germany are not. How would we explain that? When the Soviets had control over East Germany, it was part of the uh, public health policy that all citizens had to get their flu shots every year. The West did not have a similar uh, policy. So it's, I guess you could say it's custom. It's customary that people always got their flu shots and once they started doing it, then they, they stuck with it. So even though it's, uh, what, 28 years, 30 years since the, uh, the wall separating East and West came down, it, uh, it still persists today, uh, primarily with the older generation. Not the, you know, young people who were born in East Germany after the wall came down would not necessarily have that perspective. But the population in East Germany is largely older. And when we look at politics, this particular figure shows the right-wing concentration, the power base of the right-wing party in Germany. And uh, you can see that it's all in East Germany. There's a little there's a smattering of it uh, throughout West Germany, but primarily uh, the right-wing extremist parties are getting uh, much greater votes in East Germany. And here's a graph from a different source. This is a different uh, political party. Uh, this is the more, cent um, not centrist, but the more, the less extreme version of uh, right-wing party in Germany, the AFD. And it's the, the right-wing nationalist. And you see that it's very heavily concentrated in East Germany, particularly the south part of East Germany. So where am I going with this? After the wall came down, these uh, individuals who had not been able to interact with each other suddenly were able to move, but many from the east did not move, and the people in the west did not go to the east. The division, although the wall came down, uh, the division for most of the country remained intact because families had been separated and uh, people had grown. The, the wall was up for 28 years total, and it's been down now for about 30 years, I think. Uh, but uh, you have an entire generation of Germans who uh, came of age during a time in which the two parts of the country were completely separated as if they were different nations and there was no travel permitted across the two sides, at least not freely. In a New York Times article from 2018, which was the uh, 28th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, Thomas Kruger, Berlin's last mayor under the Soviet system, described it as cultural colonialism. And what he meant by that was essentially that the uh, politicians from West Germany were exercising power in the East, but not only through laws, also through the imposition of norms that uh, the West had that were different from those in the East, and that the norms of the West were uh, being imposed uh, on the citizens in the East, uh, even though they didn't like them. And there are all these differences. The West is still richer. The East is uh, currently more nationalist. There are more immigrants in the West but immigrants are viewed as more of a problem in the East. Westerners control many of the levers of power in the East through politics, although recently, the last couple of elections, the uh, right wing has been gaining more power. Uh, at the time of the writing of this article in 2018, eight in 10 judges and prosecutors in the East uh, actually grew up in the West, and so the, the judiciary itself was being run by Westerners, uh, by West Germans. And none of Germany's flagship companies listed their headquarters being based in the east part of the country. All the manufacturing, as I said earlier, is based in the west. Another Easterner in the article uh, from the New York Times uh, described life under the Soviet system in this way. Even if you don't like the system, it shapes you, it becomes part of you. How could it not? Mr. Grunbein said, 
When they marched on Mondays in 1989 against the crumbling communist system, many people did not want democracy. Many people in the East did not want democracy. They wanted prosperity and authority. They wanted a, an authoritarian leader who would be able to make them more financially successful. Now, Angela Merkel was born in East Germany, the current president of the, uh, of the nation, uh, but to those in the East, she's considered a traitor because she's aligned herself with the ideals and the norms of the West. Now, when we look at this through an uncertainty identity analysis uh, using Hogg's theory, having an identification with a less successful group, those in the East would have a particular perspective in terms of their relationship with those in the West. Increasingly, uh, those in the East would reject the ideals of the West, which are much more liberal uh, in terms of the political ideology. Some make the switch and move from the East to the West, and they are seen as traitors. So imagine uh, in the United States, the, the comparable situation would be uh, young people who are liberal-minded moving out of the farmlands and into the cities. Those individuals are seen with suspicion, I think it's fair to say, by uh, their friends who they might have left behind in, in small-town agricultural areas. Back in Germany, in order to make the East more powerful, East Germans seek an authoritarian leader, and the chant in the East is to become German again. Now that sounds very familiar uh, to an American ear. Let's make uh, Germany great again. Uh, in terms of uh, having pride in self through identity with German originalism, I mean that is the chant. In uh, in Germany, it's it, there's a direct parallel with uh, um, uh, President Trump's "Make America Great Again" slogan. And then last, in an effort to gain more political power and by doing so gain more self-esteem, the strategy is to vote to make Eastern politicians more successful, where Eastern is the identity of being in opposition to the West. So any uh, potential politician from the East who expresses solidarity with the West, uh, they're not going to be successful. The base in the East is to vote for people who distance themselves from the ideals of the West. And when we apply it to the original model that Tajfell put together for social identity theory, uh, it appears that the political tension in Germany today is partially explainable through Tajfell's model, where you have the social identities of in-group favoritism and out-group derogation. But I think it goes beyond that, that uh, when you see all these differences, and particularly the the uh, financial differences between East and West, those in the East don't have as many achievements to be proud of. And, and in fact, uh, one of the points in the article in the New York Times was that Easterners have lost a lot of their tradition and um, history because they've uh, essentially been swamped by the West. That is to say that under the Soviet rule, the things that were done in the East are not seen as being achievements that should be held up today. I, uh, instead, what are held up are the achievements of Western Germany. Now, if we take all this information about East and West Germany and we fit it into the original model that Tajfell put together uh, and perhaps add in some of the uncertainty elements from Hogg's transitioned model to uncertainty identity theory, I, I think it works rather well. For people who grew up in East Germany while the Soviet Union was in control, there would be fewer options or fewer um, opportunities for individual achievement. And individual achievements that uh, people might have had uh, would be limited to agriculture, uh, farming, to some extent the bureaucracy of working for the government of the East, and uh, 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 things that would not be highly respected in the West today, in West Germany today. So personal identity would, uh, at the top row of the graph here, uh, personal identity would have a bit of a deficit in relation to um, social comparison with those in the West. You wouldn't be able to achieve the same level of self-esteem through your personal identity and your own achievements. So who do you turn to? You turn to the group. And when you, when you examine the group affiliation, if you're in the East, and you see that your, your group is disadvantaged relative to the West, that your group is disadvantaged in terms of job opportunity, uh, manufacturing, availability of uh, pathways to the middle class, uh, and so on, what do you do instead? You accentuate the traditional. You accentuate the ways things used to be in Germany. And so there's a return to uh, old traditions and populism in Eastern Germany that simply do not appeal in the West. 
And I think the fear of immigrants stems from a, uh, largely from this, that uh, uh, those who are fearful of immigrants uh, they tend to be concentrated in the east part of Germany, in eastern Germany, but that's not where the immigrants are. So the, the immigrants aren't even taking their jobs. Uh, the immigrants aren't even having a direct impact on their lives, uh, and yet they, they feel that there's a, a greater threat. Uh, those in the east have a greater, uh, perceive a greater level of threat uh, due to immigration than those in the West. From an uncertainty identity theory position, I would uh, tend to think that it would work something like this, that an, uh, an individual living in uh, Eastern Germany would have an uncertain relationship with identity of being a German nationally speaking. Uh, that their uh, position in terms of the typical German would be different because uh, in, in the West uh, there are so many marked uh, differences. And so the, the, the affiliation has to be to Eastern Germany. Uh, and once you set that up, then you have the in-group favoritism and out-group derogation uh, that is uh, the social categorization part of the model. And this makes true unification really rather difficult. But I think that this uh, uh, example of East Germany and West Germany illustrates how this can work on a national level. The groups that a person affiliates with uh, uh, can result in extreme viewpoints about outgroups. And I think we see that all the time today in American politics. Social media uh, no doubt has accentuated this, uh, particularly with the use of memes. I would say that uh, memes and social media probably work rather well uh, as uh, communications of uh, prototypes for in-group and out-group norm purposes. But that's something I'll get into later. Thanks for listening today. I think that's a, a good place to wrap things up for now.